How do we ensure that they pay back, you know, what they have taken on credit? I mean, the only way I think we can ensure that they get pay back, I mean, which is very, very difficult, is one, you probably have to start putting them in on the same measure, I mean, with people that trade. Okay, for instance, maybe you have collateral, maybe they have collateral, maybe um, they have um, guarantors, you know, so you have to put in some other measures. But in an economy such as us, the moment you start to put that into place, you find out that you actually have very few people that are qualified for that credit in the first place. Mm -hmm. And of course, it would then affect your original aim of food expansion and reduction in poverty. Let's take it back to Lagos. Yeah, uh, Dr. Kitty, I, I, it's exciting what you're saying, but to a large extent, what you're saying, many, many people are not aware of. For instance, uh, you talked about the anchor borrowers thing. The, uh, the document released by the CBN in June of 2015 uh, listed 41 items that are not banned, but they do not just have access to foreign exchange to be imported into Nigeria. How exactly does that, does, does that help the economy to grow? You know, um, how does that help the farmers to be sure, without any equiv equivocation, that they will have a good market and they, will still, they won't have to still compete with imported goods? Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, everyone is very, very familiar with uh, with the 41 items of from Central Bank. Let's let's put that also in context. The 41 items. What the Central Bank said is that those that want to import those 41 items will not have access to the Central Bank foreign exchange window. So some of those items are not banned. You know, some of them are not banned. That's one. Secondly, there are also measures that were taken trade trade measures that were taken, actually in terms of tariffs, that increased the tariffs over some of those products, if you want to import them. So not only do you not have access to the foreign exchange to import them, the government also increased the tariffs, the tariffs if you actually source foreign exchange from somewhere else to even import them. So those were some measures, some trade restriction measures that were put in place in 2016. Okay, so but what I think has happened since that time, and of course it's been happening even before then, is that I mean, I have no way to, to, I mean, because of the nature of it anyway, you can't be sure exactly what level it is. But there has been increases. I mean, there's illegal importation of some of these items. I'm not sure anyone can deny that, and especially rice. I mean, there's illegal importation of these items because you see them in the market. And if you see them in the market, I'm sure someone brought them in. So that is one of the implications. So that is why I will go back to what I said. All these policies are good. They are, they are good and they are very, very important. However, I think we need a coherent strategy in terms of trade strategy for Nigeria. If we're going to ban, ban this, how long are we banning it for? If we're going to improve this, increase these tariffs, how long are we doing that for? If we're going to facilitate the production within the economy, what are the supports that we need? Are we providing 20% support? Are we providing 60% support? What are the kind of infrastructure needs? So we cannot just isolate these policies from central bank, from this one. We have isolated policies, but we need to improve on the coherence in which we deployed towards the strategy. Okay, Dr. Okiti, one more thing here. Uh, 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 the CBN governor was quoted as saying, any attempt to reverse the course of this action, that is the anchor borrowers along with some other policies that the CBN had come up with in managing the Nigerian economy, any attempt to reverse the course of these actions may have untold consequences on the growth trajectory of our economy. In the face of our nat natural political instability, what happens if another government comes on stream and does not continue this? What happens to the economy? Is there any law that compels the, the, any government of the day to, to follow through on a particular project? Well, I mean, I can't speak for, uh, I can't speak for any government that may come in, whether it's even this one or, the, I mean, or another party. Uh, but what I can say is this. Even though we have a policy, there is nothing that suggests that policies cannot be reviewed. So whether he's the same government that remains in power, you can always review your policies. Whether it's a new government, you can always review your policies. Yeah, the policies that we, that we had in 2016, 
may still be valid in 2018, but in 2020, they may not be valid. I said they may not be valid. So it's very, very important that uh, we have a periodic review of our policies, especially to always ask the questions, are these policies still meeting the objectives for which they were set up, for which they were established? And I think that is very, very important. So whether any, uh, whether it's the uh, opposition or the current government that continues after May 2019, and I think it is important that we have a constant review of our policies. Hmm. Well, what would you, where would you say we are right now? Sorry, I thought the Lagos was still continuing, but where would you say that we are right now? And would you say that we are on the right path? Are we on the right path to growth? Or is there something else we need to be doing as of today? I mean, if the economy is growing, mm -hmm. it means we are on the right path to growth. Mm -hmm. But the issue is that are we growing at a level in which we are comfortable in terms of poverty? No. Are we going at a level in which we should be comfortable in terms of unemployment? No. Mm -hmm. So that brings me, so if we are not comfortable, the government is not comfortable, I as a citizen am not comfortable, the international community is not comfortable, nobody is comfortable with 2% growth rate in Nigeria because that's not even up to the percentage of, the, um, of population growth rate. It means that the average Nigeria is getting poorer and poorer, so we are not comfortable. So let's start from that base. If we are not comfortable, what should we do? What we should do is, I mean, maybe in a way slightly belong, beyond this kind of, but let's put it this way. We need economic reforms. I mean, on a scale that we have not seen before. Let me give you a context. If you look at the year 1999, early 2000, and uh, that 2003 to 2007, hmm? Nigeria went through a spate of economic reforms like we've never seen even before then. So whether you talk of banking, whether you talk of pension, whether you talk of um, insurance, whether you talk of um, uh, stability of uh, the budgetary process, I mean, just a number of reforms. Mm. Now, we need something like that now, but different now because we've gone past that. For instance, what's going to happen to forest subsidy? I mean, I think that is a question that we need to ask ourselves. What do you think should happen to it? They should not be for subsidy because you are subsidizing consumption. Mm. You are subsidizing, you can subsidize production. There's nothing wrong with subsidy per se. It depends on what you are subsidizing. Mm. You know? But so, you know, I mean, you have seen just how delicate that issue is in Nigeria. How would you suggest that any government, well, that's a question I'll have to leave. <laughs> I'll have to leave for you to answer when we come back from this break. It's, okay. it's going to be, you know, on what any government should do to avoid the immediate aftershocks that will come in the event of removing fuel subsidy. Please stay with us. Well, Dr. Ogo Kiti is still with us in the studio. And it's our closing moment with him. And just before we wrap it up, we'll quickly ask him, you know, what any government should do uh, to ensure that the aftershocks of removing fuel subsidy, which, is, which he says is subsidizing consumption, uh, how they should handle that. How would you suggest they do that? Yeah. So let me take you back. Uh, what we have in Nigeria in relation to fire uh, prices, mm -hmm. and you can even say in relation to minimum wage, mm -hmm. and you can say in relation to some extent, I mean the exchange rate, there are what we call step functions. <clears throat> so what it means that you have a staircase improvement in those prices over time. Uh, you don't have them gradually. So look back to 2016. I mean, we had a five months, <clears throat> five months collapse, I mean, because of a fire crisis and the fuel price had to go up, because that's the, that's the best thing, I mean, that should have happened in the first place. The first price actually went up. If you look at it from that point of view, what we had was a one-off permanent shock, a one-off permanent shock, and the shock will work through itself, will work itself through the economy. So if you remove the source of the, the same thing will happen. You have a one-off permanent shock. That's it. Mm. That's what you have. But the one of it permanent, the one of permanent shock yes. could be intense, and some people will also argue that it might not be a one of permanent shock in the sense that fuel prices go up and down, and we are still importing. We are not producing enough, yes. or if we, are, if we are producing at all, we're not producing enough for the people of this country. So we're still importing majorly what we consume in the that country. That is very, very interesting. And we'll be at the mercy of those who are importing the petrol, no, considering no, 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 the no. fact that you know we are we are. We are importing the petrol and the prices can go up or go down. Yes. There's nothing wrong in prices going up or going down. 
the question is how do we handle those shocks that will come as a result of them going up? If you go up and go down, what you find out is that those shocks are not significant. They're not. Because maybe today you buy for it at 97. Tomorrow you buy it at 99. Mm. Next week you buy it at 102. Those are not significant shocks. Those are things that you can walk through your home personal finances over time. Mm. I mean, you can reduce this journey. You can reduce that trip. What about those, what what about have... those who depend on transporters? Those who, you know, and you exactly. know, we, we, all, we all know that when transporters increase their prices, they hardly, rarely bring okay. them down. Okay, let me give you an example. If you notice, I don't know about Lagos, I don't know about Port Harcourt, but in Abuja, for instance, uh, recently, you have some filling stations, they sell at 150. Hmm? Sorry, 145, which is what the government's. But some filling stations sell at 142. Some sell at 143. So people rush to the ones that are actually selling at 142 or 143. So that is what you actually have when you have all these, my, oh, all these very, very insignificant increases and, in, increases and reduction in prices. But when you have from 97 to 145, that is even the most dangerous to the economy mm -hmm. because you're having a very, very huge shock mm -hmm. that walks itself through the economy, sometimes over six quarters, mm -hmm. sometimes over eight quarters. Mm -hmm. So once you deregulate the prices at the pumps, you have a one-off permanent shock, and that is it. So you're telling government, bite the bullet? Absolutely. Hmm. Well, I, I hope they survive it when they... When they they will. They you, survived you think, it in 2016. I, I hope that any government... Well, sometimes they will say that they were trading on goodwill. If any government attempts to do that again this time around, you know, you know how it will be. But let us see how that goes. I mean, I don't know if it's an advice that any government will take right now or the one that is going to come in, considering the fact that it's also a, an election matter. But let us see how that goes. Uh, we have to thank you most kindly for coming on the program. Thank you Dr. very much. Dr. Okiti is the CEO of Time Economics Limited. And it's in speaking to us now, Abuja Studios. Well, that's the program today. We have to thank you most kindly for participating, for sending your comments and your messages. I'm Maokwe Ogun Yusuf. Oh, yes, indeed. I'm Chamberlain Uso. And I'm Ayo Makine. Have a wonderful day. The views and opinions expressed by guests on this program are those of the maker and do not reflect the views, opinions, and endorsement of Channels Television.